Thank you for attending our talk today. Uh, service Mesh, a hole in the pocket. Um, a little bit about your presenters today. My name is John Murray. Uh, I am a engineer on the service networking team at Stripe, uh, building our internal service mesh. Uh, I am an occasional Envoy contributor uh, when the need arises. Um, and outside of work, I am a C++ enthusiast. And I'm Vanil Narona. I work on the service mesh platform at Stripe. I've been a contributor in the Istio and Envoy communities, and I really enjoy distributed systems. Okay, so let's jump into the promises of service mesh. Uh, first is a simplified application network. Right? You get features like load balancing, circuit breaking, retries. Um, and the service mesh is going to provide all these features in a way that's really easy to take advantage of for application owners. Right? It may be simple specifying a few headers on the request. Um, and you know, this works across different languages and frameworks. Uh, next is traffic patterns. Um, so you have like things like green deployments, traffic splitting, traffic shaping, uh, fault injection. Um, these are similar to kind of the uh, application networking features before, but they're more organizational wide, right? Um, so whether it's for reliability or for like advanced deployment scenarios, um, these are kind of features you're going to want as your company scales. Uh, security, which for, for most people is going to look something like mutual MTLS, uh, or sorry, MTLS uh, and role-based uh, access controls. Um, and then lastly, uh, observability, right? Uh, metrics, access logs, distributed tracing. Um, and you know, as your organization grows, you're going to want a lot of these features, a lot of these controls. You're going to want uh, uniform uh, interfaces for all these things. Uh, and the service mesh kind of solves this, uh, especially given that as a company grows, we typically see um, more languages, more frameworks kind of uh, being used, whether it's through uh, evolving development practices internally, or maybe it's through something like an acquisition. Um, and so having a service mesh unifies all of these interfaces into kind of one access point, both for control and development. Okay, so what are the costs of running a service mesh? Uh, at a high level, uh, there's explicit costs. So this is the cost uh, that we typically think about upfront uh, when we're doing our research and we're deciding on whether we want to adopt the service mesh or not. Uh, there's the hidden costs, right? The cost that you're typically not going to think about uh, before adopting. You're usually going to find this after you've adopted, implemented, and kind of ran with the service mesh for a while. Uh, there's integration costs, right? Which is uh, what does it cost to kind of hook my service mesh up to, to other uh, third-party services? Um, we'll see what those are in a little bit. Uh, developer costs. Um, you know, it's, it's not necessarily free for developers to, to build on top of the service mesh. So what does it take to provide that level of education um, and uh, productivity that you want to deliver to your developers for them to be effective? Uh, and lastly, support costs, right? The service mesh uh, isn't going to run it itself. Um, so, so what does it cost to maintain and operate a service mesh? Okay, let's jump into the uh, explicit costs. Uh, first is CPU. Um, right, uh, and uh, under the here I have misconfigured quota, right, because it's, it's sometimes too easy to uh, maybe provide too much uh, CPU and you're just kind of burning money or you provide too little, maybe you're impacting kind of your latency uh, overhead. Uh, same kind of goes for memory, where right? you, can, you can allocate too much and you're just kind of burning money, you allocate too little and you may be impacting the performance of your applications. Uh, latency, uh, misconfigure concurrency, so you know, different ways you can configure uh, your service mesh and how much resources it takes up uh can also impact kind of that latency um and yeah so these are these are the explicit costs these are things we think about right like how how much money is it gonna is it gonna cost to actually run this new code on all of my machines um and what is the the latency i'm gonna expect to add to all of my requests uh that are all the requests that are flowing through the service mesh okay so now let's look at the hidden costs uh first up network bandwidth usage uh, particularly thinking about control plane traffic um, so the, the configuration data you ship from your control plane to your envoys, uh, depending on your fleet size, may be fairly large, maybe in the order of megabytes. Uh, if you're operating a significantly large fleet, maybe gigabytes. Um, and depending on your topology, you may be shipping this data around to thousands, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of nodes, right? And so that's all um, kind of network bandwidth usage that you have to get kind of add into your costs now. Uh, next is IO costs. So the, the service mesh makes a lot of things implicit that maybe previously were explicit, 
Uh, so an example here might be availability zones, whereas before maybe your code accounted for crossing those availability zone regions. Uh, with a service mesh, you have to be careful on how you configure it because you may be crossing those boundaries uh, without knowing it and paying those additional costs. Uh, there's also like feature specific costs, right? Health check, especially active health checking is, is sending more data across the wire across your network to check all of the health of the upstreams. Um, this can kind of turn into a star pattern sometimes with service meshes. So the, uh, you, know, you have to be careful about how much traffic you're generating just from health checks. Um, and other features like hedging and retries, these, these are reliability features. These are probably features we want, but we need to understand that they're not necessarily free and we are gonna be generating more uh, network costs by using them. Okay, so next up is integration costs. Uh, so we can think first with like metrics, right? Uh, the service mesh uh, is, is generates a ton of metrics. Um, it generates metrics that are uniform across a bunch of different types of applications. So they're, they're highly useful for debugging your system, understanding your system. Um, however, sometimes they can generate a rather insane amount of metrics, uh, probably more than you need. Um, and uh, you're gonna have to think about uh, the cost associated with storing those um, and the vendor cost, right? So if you're uploading to the cloud, um, it's kind of your vendor cost. If you're, even if you're running uh, your own internal metric system like a Prometheus store, uh, you're gonna have to think about all the Prometheus clusters that you're gonna have to run to support the metrics coming from your service mesh. Uh, log storage uh, is the same way. Um, service mesh can produce uniform access logging, which can be super useful for, for debugging and troubleshooting heterogeneous systems. Um, but again, like, you know, that's, it can get very costly very quickly. Um, and you can be generating, you know, terabytes or more of data uh, every day, every hour. Uh, so it is definitely something to consider. Um, and in the same vein as log storage is distributed tracing, right? Uh, you know, you're going to be generating a lot of different spans. Uh, so you need to think uh, up front, if that's a feature you want to use, um, how much you're going to allocate for, for storage costs. Okay, so developer costs. Uh, this mainly boils down to education. Um, so you're going to need to kind of train your developers on like how to uh, debug and troubleshoot certain errors that may arise from the service mesh or use of the service mesh, um, and then kind of teach them code patterns to, to use and avoid, right? So this is kind of really understanding uh, the interfaces of the service mesh and, and how to work with it. Um, the, the mesh is not always as transparent as it may be marketed to be or as we may hope it to be. Um, so education is important. Uh, and lastly, just kind of managing resource quotas, right? Especially if you're uh, running in like a, like a Kubernetes type system with, with uh, maybe like an Envoy sidecar as an example, um, then you're gonna, your, your developers are gonna need to know uh, how to appropriately set quotas for the service mesh um, and what the trade-off is there between uh, cost and uh, maybe performance, right? All right, so support costs. Uh, first up is kind of maintenance, right? Um, this may be something like CVE patches, uh, and these things you have to do, you have to stay secure, so you need to spend the time to, to patch your service mesh and roll out all the fixes. Uh, you may have other patches as well. They're just kind of like bug fix patches that you may find. Uh, service meshes typically represent a lot of different traffic patterns, and not all of those patterns have equal coverage uh, from your upstream like uh, provider of that, that open source software. Uh, so you may need to find that you're fixing stuff yourself sometimes. Uh, API compatibility and upgrades. So uh, looking at the Envoy ecosystem as an example, um, the XDS, the, the migration from V2 to V3 uh, involved a lot of work um, and potentially down the road, a V3 to V4 migration in that configuration language will also involve a fair bit of work, um, which kind of scales as your, as your fleet size grows. Operations, uh, data plane upgrades, right? If you're deploying a mesh in a sidecar pattern, this may just be a lot of nodes to update, a lot of time spent doing those upgrades. Uh, control plane upgrades, they may fall in the same boat. Uh, you may be using a central control plane, um, in which case your upgrades are faster, but they're also much riskier, more dangerous. So there's just additional time taken to make sure that you get that right. Uh, and things like sort rotations, like these things, all these things just kind of take time. Uh, troubleshooting is the next big one. Uh, we talked about developer education how, and how that's important for uh, users to understand how to troubleshoot errors and work with the service mesh, but their service mesh implementations can just be 
a lot. You know, they're built very generally to serve a lot of different use cases. And, and so, um, you know, it, when there's a critical service having issues, it can be really hard to be to, to tell them, hey, go read this giant body of documentation and like, you'll be able to figure out your own problem. Sometimes you just have to jump in, uh, get things fixed, get things up and running. Uh, so your team operating service mesh will probably spend a fair amount of their time troubleshooting. Uh, and lastly, ownership of client libraries. Again, in developer education, we talked about patterns and practices uh, when working with a service mesh. You may decide that uh, it's easier to take those patterns and practices and implement them inside of a client library that you distribute to your users. But again, this is you know another form or another another way of cost uh, for that particular issue that you should consider. Uh, so that wraps us up for costs. Uh, I'm going to hand it off to Vanil now to talk about strategies for controlling cost. Thank you, John. Let's now have a look at some strategies for controlling costs. I will first give you an overview of different strategies, and then I will dive into each one. The first strategy is to understand defaults. Service meshes and proxies come with default configurations, which can affect the proxy's behavior of routing requests or the amount of data generated by these service meshes. Therefore, it becomes important to understand these defaults in order to control costs. The next strategy is to sample access logs. Depending on the amount of traffic flowing through a system, your service mesh can generate a large number of access logs. This can quickly increase your storage costs and having a good sampling strategy for your access logs can help you cut down these costs. Similar to that is metrics. Because service mesh proxies can generate a large number of stats, it can quickly overwhelm your metrics systems. Therefore, it becomes important to simplify metrics in order to reduce costs. The final strategy here is to perform AZ aware routing. AZ stands for availability zones. Cloud vendor, uh, vendors typically have policies for networking and IO. And when your requests cross AZ borders, it's going to cost you. It becomes then important to identify services that are routing across AZs and also ways to minimize cross AZ traffic. Let's now have a look at some details. Envoy, for example, has default HTTP2 configuration. For example, you can configure max con concurrent streams, or you can leave it at the default. You can also configure Envoy's concurrency, which basically is the number of worker threads that Envoy must use for request processing. Envoy also comes with default retry and circuit breaker configurations, which affects the way requests are routed through your system. By default, Envoy generates a lot of stats, so it becomes important for you to figure out which of these are meaningful and which ones to discard. If you, for example, misconfigure Envoy's concurrency or HTTP2 configuration, it can degrade performance, thereby increasing your, your costs. If you leave circuit breaker or retry configurations to default, it can affect the way your requests are routed through your system in a failure scenario, and that can increase your network usage, thereby increasing costs. And as I said, metrics by default can overwhelm your metric system. So understanding the default behavior of your service meshes or proxies is important to cut down costs associ associated with metrics. You typically see a lot of 2xx responses in your system. These are not very interesting. So logging them can definitely overwhelm your system, but not provide you good insight. It therefore becomes important to identify what is your use case for access logs. In some cases, you may want to use access logs for incident remediation, but in other cases, you may want to use this for long-term learning. For example, to visualize a service graph of all the components in your system. You can also think of sampling or filtering access logs depending on your need. In the case of Stripe, we completely discard all 2xx responses, and we also discard all responses associated with health checks. 
by that i mean we do not log any of these kind of responses service mesh proxies generate a large number of stats and they can quickly overwhelm your metric storage system that basically means that you will be spending a lot of money just on your metric store storage system these metrics can also increase increase cognitive load because these come from disparate sources so it becomes important to simplify um, observability for service owners to easily understand the state of the system using metrics you can think of simplifying metrics by either filtering out uh, irrelevant metrics or you can also think of combining metrics from different sources in order to provide a unified view so that it's easier to understand them and at the same time you do not store all of these metrics which can increase your costs at stripe if we do not control the way metrics are generated it has the cap capacity to quickly consume a majority of our metrics budget Finally, let's have a look at how AZ-Aware routing can increase your spend. Cloud vendors charge for traffic that crosses AZ borders. So you need to identify which services really route across AZs. This could also be just the control plane communication itself. Once you identify which services route across AZs, it becomes then easier to identify whether that is really required or you can cut that down. This is one of the benefits of using a service mesh that is now you can control services and their routing behaviors so that they can prefer local services versus ones that are routing that are running remotely. You need to take care though that if there is a local outage your service is still up and running that is by preferring a remote service over a failing local service and for that you may want to implement health checks or you may want to employ outlier detection. Let's now have a look at some open problems. The first one is troubleshooting. When you deploy your application on a service mesh, it becomes a little difficult to figure out where problems actually exist. Whether the problem is with the application itself, or whether it is with the network, or whether it is with the service mesh is a little hard to tell. Therefore, you may want to spend some efforts on building tooling to aid troubleshooting. One thing that comes to mind here is to hand over the ownership of client libraries to the networking team. By doing that, the networking team can instrument these client libraries to aid troubleshooting. But at the same time, it becomes difficult to figure out where to draw the line between this team owning network interfaces versus business abstractions. Another important aspect is developer education. What can we do to educate developers about service mesh behavior? Here we are talking about application developers. Can service meshes be 100% transparent to service owners or do we need to build higher level abstractions or write huge documentation in order to educate developers? Finally, another important point is maintenance. How can we simplify upgrades? Envoy releases are typically done every three months, and there are CVE patches that come in between. Deploying these to a large scale system can be time consuming. Also, when there is a API upgrade within Envoy, it can become difficult to migrate between one API to another. How can we minimize this friction? Also, hot restarts may not be available across different Envoy versions. So how do we ensure that upgrades are smooth. These kind of questions are still open. In summary, we had a look at the promises of a service mesh, costs of running a service mesh, some strategies for controlling costs, some open problems. And now a big question remains, that is, is it worth it? We do think that service meshes can solve interesting challenges for you but you need to be very intentional about what features you require from a service mesh. You need to understand what features to enable, what are its defaults, what sort of logs and metrics can these features generate 
and how much of your budget can it consume? With that, we would like to end the talk. Thank you. Stripe is hiring, so feel free to reach out to us if you are interested. And now we are open for questions.